Awesome. My screen's not working. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Let's see what that does. Hey, okay. Um, Fabio, can you unmute on your end? Because it's not letting me unmute you. Sure. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All the tech fails today. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. Uh, I am your host with the Broken Lower Third, uh, Nicole Gallucci, uh, postdoc with CosmoQuest uh, at uh, Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. My co-host, Georgia, is uh, still on vacation. I hope you're enjoying the mountains, Georgia. We miss you. Um, I have with me our, our guest today, Fabio Del Sordo. So, hello. Hello. <laughs> Um, so as usual, you guys watching can use the Q&A app to leave us comments and questions. Um, you may notice I've put the Showcase app back on as well. Um, turns out there's a way to toggle between Showcase, where I can show you the links about what we're talking about, and um, the Q&A, the comments and questions. So if you check the comments stream on either event page, CosmoQuests or mine, I've added a screenshot that points to the little button you need to use. Uh, this way, I don't know, backwards, whatever. Um, it's, yeah, here, <laughs> it looks like a Rubik's Cube. You click that, you can switch between Showcase, one of the newer um, Google Plus little app thingies where we have links to what we're talking about, and the Q&A app. So if you're watching with the Q&A open, use that little Rubik's Cube to go back and forth. So we've already got a hello from a bunch of people, from Guido in Germany, from Nancy Graziano, and from Helg. Helg, I, I'm probably pronouncing your name improperly, so uh, let me know how to correct that. So thank you guys for saying hi in the comments, and welcome to the show. Um, so today we are talking about a very cool project called Galileo Mobile. Um, do you want to just give us a brief overview, Fabio, of, of what is Galileo Mobile? Sure. Well, first of all, I introduce myself. Yeah. Um, I'm an astrophysicist. I just started a new job at Yale University uh, 10 days ago. Well, uh, yeah. Welcome to your new office. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And uh, I'm a co-founder of this Galileo Mobile project, which I will... Uh, try to explain to, to the audience today. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is a project that started in um, actually 2008, and, uh, but it became active in 2009. That was International Year of Astronomy. And the main focus of the project is to use astronomy uh, as a framework to share uh, the idea of critical thinking and uh, to do a cultural, cultural exchange with uh, places, villages, and countries in which uh, outreach programs of astronomy are not that common. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that what best introduced our program is our motto that is under the same sky. means that we want to share uh, astronomy or culture or uh, ideas with, uh, with people all around the world. Cool. Yeah, it sounds like there were a lot of projects that started around that era uh, 2009, when the International Year of Astronomy happened, that have a global perspective on astronomy and that whole concept of we, we share that sky, um, which is awesome. So what what um, what encouraged you? What inspired you to to start this program? Well, yeah, this program was started uh, actually after an idea of uh, one of our co-founder, uh, which is. Uh, Feel. Uh, he had this idea of uh, doing some, some outreach and connect it with a, an expedition. And uh, then he managed to, to, to spread this idea and he found a bunch of people who were uh, actually willing to, to do that. Personally, uh, first speak uh, just for, my, for myself and uh, well, it was the idea of traveling and of um, doing this uh, using astronomy as reason for traveling. And moreover, the idea was to travel to South America in 2009, which is a continent that I did never visit by that time. And um, actually, it was a continent that uh, has always attracted me since I was uh, very little. So it was a kind of uh, weird uh, coincidence that uh, at 
all of a sudden, when I was about to start my PhD in astronomy, uh, um, this opportunity showed up. And so I had no doubt in a, that I should have been part of that. And I think that something similar happened also for uh, all the other members. Uh, many of them uh, realized that this idea was quite cool. And so the idea was to turn this dream into reality and make it real. So where were you doing your PhD at the time when this started? So when this started, I was between my master and my PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, I did my master in Italy, in, uh, in Pisa, and uh, my PhD in uh, Stockholm, in uh, Sweden. Uh, we had our first meeting in uh, late fall 2008. I started my PhD in, at the beginning of 2009. Okay. Yeah. So where was the first expedition? So, um, well, first of all, I'd say that many of the people at the beginning were based in Munich, in Germany. Uh, apart from uh, myself, I was in, uh, in Stockholm. And then uh, one of the members, Phil, uh, was in, um, in Göttingen, in Germany. Then the first expedition uh, took place in the fall 2009. And um, you know, we went to the, um, the Andes, and the mountains on the Altiplano, between uh, a, re a region that is shared between Bolivia, Peru, and Chile. And this was just perfect for several reasons. One of which is that we managed to visit, to visit three countries using basically one language, that is Spanish. Although we also visited communities uh, where people do not really speak Spanish, because they some, somewhere there they, they still speak uh, their native languages, and um, uh, yes, on the map it's uh, we can see some of the places that we visited, oh. and um, we visited also places uh, like in Peru where we couldn't speak Spanish with them, so we had to ask help to local people to translate our Spanish to, to Quechua. And um, so this region is quite interesting because it's, uh, geographically speaking, it's one region, but it's shared between three countries. And also because they have a, a strong uh, astronomical uh, heritage. So they have a big uh, uh, heritage in uh, ancient astronomy. So the Incas cultural astronomy and also Tiwanaku cultural astronomy there are quite strong. And in fact, they have uh, other um, constellations with respect of the Western constellations. Mm -hmm. uh, I could also speak a bit more about that if you want. So yeah, and moreover, uh, that region is in that region the sky is really great. So it's quite natural for people to look at the sky and to just feel connected a lot with, with stars and constellations. Yeah, uh, we have a question from Ilad Avram asking, uh, is the sky very different in the Southern Hemisphere? Can you explain what the Southern Hemisphere sky is like for someone who lives in the Northern Hemisphere? Sure. Well, um, yeah, it is different from the sky in the Northern Hemisphere for several reasons, uh, one of which is that you actually see uh, different stars. It depends on where you are in the Southern Hemisphere. But for instance, one of the reference star in the northern hemisphere is the polar star, and you cannot see it in uh, uh, in the southern uh, hemisphere. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on the other hand, you can see, for instance, uh, the Magellanic clouds that are uh, uh, the galaxies that are closest to the Milky Way to our galaxy. And moreover, if you see the same constellation. Uh, the same constellations appears in the sky in a different way, so it's uh, most of the time upside down. And uh, and in fact, it's quite difficult if you go there for the first time to understand what which constellation and which star you're looking at. Yeah, that that I know quite well. Um, see if I can get a decent image up. Um, so, w although we started off saying we all live under the same sky, there is the same sky around the entire Earth, but which part of it you see depends on your, your latitude. So I'll try and sure. share this really quickly. Um, that sure, celestial yeah. sphere. Whoopsie. Mm. Uh, try that again. Okay. Um, 
So like you're saying, if you imagine all the stars on a sphere, which they're not, but we'll just go with this for, for illustration's sake, um, the North Celestial Pole, so all these continents in the Northern Hemisphere can easily see this star, which is the yeah. North Star, but you can't see that from where you were in the Southern Hemisphere necessarily. You see the constellations that are, are down here. Um, yeah. And yeah, it is totally disorienting if you're, especially if you're someone who's gotten to know the night sky fairly well where you live, uh, because yeah. you look up and you don't know what's going on. <laughs> what was it like learning the new constellations and, and learning all of that? Well, it was so speaking about southern sky constellations, yeah. it was nice to to finally see them, at least for me, because it was the first time I went in the in the other hemisphere. Uh -huh. um, so I could actually, for the first time, see constellation that I just read about before. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other end, there are constellations in the Inca, Inca culture, and uh, these constellations are, uh, of course, based on uh, on uh, figures that are common in their culture, that in 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 their uh, in their region. Like for instance, there is Lama constellation. Uh, and of course, I mean this is related with uh, animals and facts that they uh, they have in uh, in their own uh, region. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, another interesting point is that many of the constellations they have are based on actually rich uh, uh, dark regions in the sky. Mm -hmm. So while uh, we con we tend to make like drawings. In in the sky, uh, just connecting stars, they tend to identify dark regions and see these dark regions as drawings themselves. Right, because the Milky is, Way yeah. is so prominent because you you can see yeah. the galactic center better. Yeah, absolutely. The Milky Way is very prominent, and this is also disorienting because sometimes uh, the sky is so clear that you see so many stars. Actually, you can there is kind of I mean, the sky is really luminous, uh, even if, if there is no moon, and uh, you can use the the light coming from the stars and from the Milky Way to, to just uh, look, take a look around you. It's really it's really impressive. So, so um, uh, these are areas that don't have much light pollution. What are so that the towns and the places you visited? What were they like? What were the people like? What was the um, infrastructure like? What was the what, what was that like? So um, yeah, very we visited very different uh, regions, very different towns. So mm -hmm. I was traveling for uh, the most of the, the most of the time, but not for the whole time. Uh, and personally, I visited uh, like the first community I visited. It's a community on a little island in the middle of Titicaca Lake. It is called the Isla del Sol, Island of yeah. the Sun. Yeah. And um, yeah, this was a uh, Quite touching moment, also because uh, we were connected with a local uh, shaman. So it's like a, a magician who who made this uh, uh, ritual of uh, asking permission to observe the sky and to uh, without say hurting the local gods. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so we went from something like this to something like. Uh, Bit different, like uh, in um, in Cusco, for instance. Cusco is a quite famous city in Peru, um, and we went to schools there. And um, well, this city is much more, uh, say, close to to what we can imagine. Of course, uh, Peru is mm, still very different from uh, here in the United States or uh, Europe, but uh, nevertheless, it's Quite touristic, Cusco. So we we felt more or less at ease easily. Um, in Chile, we visited regions that are uh, in the desert, in Atacama Desert, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, here once again uh, we are totally different landscape. Uh, in terms of infrastructures, uh, we so our project is mainly concentrated on uh, visiting schools and. Uh, interaction with students and teachers. So at that time we were there mainly for uh, doing activities with students, but we also managed to make to participate and to make a two days workshop for teachers. Oh, cool. Yeah, and actually this was the, the first workshop for teachers which we 
we did in our history. Uh, but then we realized that uh, this is kind of central point in our action. So in following expeditions, we we concentrated also on teacher workshops. And uh, we went to many schools which had no telescope, which had no, some of the schools had some computers, but they were mainly absolutely not uh, equipped for uh, doing anything related with astronomy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in fact, we realized that sometimes, uh, so by that time we visited the school just one day per school. But if you go to schools like like this, uh, where they don't have any equipment, any previous knowledge about astronomy, then you maybe need to spend more time there to just to really leave some imprint on on people, on mm -hmm. kids, and also on um, teachers. Um, Yes, I, I don't know if I if I really answered to your question, but it's quite. Uh, no, that's good. It's giving us a question. sense of, of what it's like. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we we have a great comment and question from Guido uh, Bieber in Germany. Uh, so he, he likens uh, Galileo Mobile to missionary work instead of uh, you're spreading astronomy. Um, have you ever encountered any resistance to learning astronomy from the students or the people you visited, or were they all uh, kind of welcoming? So, um, yeah, I see that uh, you also mentioned uh, religion in, in the yeah, yeah. question. Well, uh, resistance I will not say. Resistance I will not say because astronomy is something that at the first glance amazes basically everybody. So it's something, it's a particular science because the laboratory is available for everybody. It's mm -hmm. a sky, at least at the first glance. And, uh, I mean, it's very easy to be for your attention to be catched by astronomy. So in this sense, it's very lucky science. Mm -hmm. So there was no resistance. But of course, many times we we were in some way in contrast with uh, uh, what they knew, uh, the previous knowledge that mainly came, came from religion. Mm -hmm. So for instance, there were questions about the origin of the universe, Big Bang. And when you have to speak about this, of course, you have to speak about uh, the history of time, the history of the universe, and uh, the local, uh, I mean, uh, actual theories, and they're in conflict with religion. So many of the students sometimes were, uh, were uh, a bit confused, mm -hmm. I have to say. And uh, we needed to give uh, further explanations. First explanation that we say is that actually they have to consider the two kinds of knowledge in a separate way. I mean, Religion is something that uh, tend to give the meaning to what you do, and while science tend to say, to explain what we can say, right. what we can demonstrate about uh, about the universe, about not only stars but also about uh, things on, on our planet. Uh, well, it, it's a it's a quite uh, delicate uh, topic, but in yeah. the end, especially in our last uh, trip. That was in one of the last trips, uh, was in 2013, last year uh, to Uganda. Uh, well, there were many questions about this, and I can anticipate that in uh, our documentary that will be soon released about this trip, there will be also a section dedicated to, to this topic. Yeah, I, I discovered a couple months ago, I mean, you don't have to go far. Uh, to run into that that question of understanding the world through religion or through science, because I I did a um, what was it a summer camp uh, just the next town over, and and I had students asking me questions about that. They're like, wait, sure. wait, 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 you said the universe is 13 billion years old? What? Yeah. And and yeah, so they they and you know so we we talked a bit about and like you said it's a delicate it's a delicate subject because you know you don't want to scare them off of science. Because it could affect uh, the pre-existing world. Yeah, period. I mean, and especially, I mean, if you say teach about astronomy in, say, United States, mm -hmm. okay, you can be quite direct. But uh, if you travel somewhere else in the world, I mean, you just show up there, and yeah. you don't want to step over uh, their knowledge and their uh, beliefs. Right. You just don't want to be conquistador. Right. You, you, yeah. Yeah. You, you, I mean, our, our goal is to go there and share knowledge, to speak with them, to interact, to, to manage to have a, a deep interaction, as deep as possible. 
it's outreach, not colonialism. Yeah, I totally understand. Yeah. I totally get that. Yeah, I could see where there'd be an is 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 issue. Um, and uh, Nancy Graziano also has a question, also uh, <laughs> calling it astro astronomical missionary work. Uh, what has surprised you most about doing this work? Um, in, then I will also comment on missionary work. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, surprise. Uh, well, su what surprised me is uh, let me think. Personally, I think that actually the, the simple fact that Astronomy is a kind of really common language, mm -hmm. at least at, at the beginning. You know, start speaking with uh, with people. It's uh, something that uh, catch the attention of many kids all around the world. Yeah, this is something that at the beginning maybe didn't surprise me this much because I, uh, I mean I'm interested in astronomy since I was little. But then I realized that okay, this was just for myself. Then it's not trivial that it's for uh, for everybody else. And also. Uh, People are really excited to to receive uh, our visits. Mm -hmm. um, they are really excited to feel part of a big community that includes also people in other continents. And so, I mean, maybe they have the vision that they live daily in their little school, but then they see that there are people coming from uh, from Europe, United States, or other countries anyway, uh, visiting them. So they feel more important. And uh, yeah, this kind of surprised me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in terms of missionary work, uh, well, it is true that uh, a basic aspect of Galileo Mobile is that we are uh, all volunteers. Mm -hmm. So most of us are uh, in astronomy or in astrophysics. Uh, not all of us. Some others are educators or uh, journalists. Uh, because our project is quite complex, and we also need skills in other uh, in other fields. Yeah. Um, it is volunteer, uh, but I also feel that every time we we are engaged in uh, organizing an expedition and also in traveling, we actually gain a lot ourselves. So it's something that managed to make us grow a lot personally and both as both personally and as a team. So yeah, missionary if you want to call it like this. But we also feel uh, rich in doing that. What kind of um, what have you gotten most out of out of doing these expeditions? Well, uh, from the expedition, I surely feel that I improved the ability to interact with other people, to be flexible, and uh, to adapt myself to to have different people uh, just to to speak with from the expedition. From working in the team, uh, well, you have to develop a lot of skills like uh, organizing uh, like uh, meetings or uh, in um, uh, so teamwork. Uh, you also have to be to be able to interact with other other people in the team, other, other team members. And this is something that is not trivial. I think that each of the Galileo Mobile members grew up a lot. In, uh, in this sense, yes. So I see, that, hmm? I see that there was a question, have you been in Paranal? Yes, we've been there in, in our first, uh, we've been in Paranal during our first travel to okay. South America. Uh, it was an interesting visit. It was by the end of the travel. We, we managed to, to be in contact with people working in Paranal. Uh, also because ESO was uh, one of uh, the institutions which supported us. And uh, yeah, we paid a visit there and it's an amazing place. So that's where the, the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, is located. It's a question yes. from, from Peter. Um, yeah, I'll, I've noticed it, at least it, for, for the the ones around South America, you mentioned the Atacama as well. There are, are tele several telescopes in the Atacama right now. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> is Were you able to bring the fact that there were local major observatories um, to excite the, the students? Uh, yeah, this was uh, important, especially in, in Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Chile feels very strongly in the presence of these big observatories. Yep. And uh, uh, yeah, so the students were uh, also understood that we were connected with these telescopes. Originally, we went there to visit the Paranal. Uh, also because we have filmed the documentary 
it's available online on our website. It's called uh, Under the Same Sky. Well, actually, the original title is in Spanish, Bajo Mismo Cielo. And uh, so the idea was to film something from Paranal to be included in, in, in the documentary. Uh, then in the end, this is not a central point of, of the documentary, but I mean, the scenery there is really amazing. Cool. So the initial trip happened in 2009, uh, and then there were several expeditions several years later. So what happened in, in between? Did your organization grow? Did you pull in new partners? What got the ball rolling again in, in 2012? So originally the idea was to have just one expedition. So the World Galileo Mobile should have been one, one expedition, one documentary, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course it took time to, uh, to complete the documentary. Uh, it took one year to, to get it done and then uh, other time to, to get it published online. Uh, but then meanwhile we realized that uh, well, all of us, or many of us, were so involved, so engaged in the project that we could not just leave it like that. And we had such a good feedback from many, many different sources, both from communities we visited and from uh, uh, also when we went to conferences, for instance, comments to talks about Galileo Mobile. And so we decided to to keep it going. And uh, we're going to it's another expedition to India. It was our second expedition in 2012. This was connected with a conference to which many of us uh, went independently for our research. Uh, and then we managed to make this two week expedition in India around uh, Bangalore. And India is also a very great area to visit uh, for doing astronomy because there are a lot of local astronomers. So, in this sense, when we went there, we realized that if we give the aspiration to do outreach and to bring it on, uh, there are local people who can keep doing that. And this is actually what's happening in India. Because after our expedition in 2012, there have been also follow-up activities. And, um, and this is exactly the spirit of what we want to do. We want to inspire local people to, to keep speaking about astronomy. So here's your travel map uh, around Bangalore. Uh, how long was this? How long did this expedition take? Well, this was a two-week expedition, okay. kind of a, a, say short expedition, but still, it's uh, quite demanding. Yeah. I, 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 I haven't been there. Uh, I did not go, but other team members went because so while on the first expedition, uh, basically all of us traveled, but one person. Uh, Federico, who decided to not to travel, but his, uh, I mean, his work has been basic <laughs> for all of us. Well, uh, then our team also grew up, and so only some of us managed to travel, both for a, a time constraint and for a money constraint, because we had to look for a funding for traveling, mm. and uh, yeah, and also we do this in our spare time. <laughs> It's not our uh, our main main job. Right. So yeah, and then we since then we managed to do uh, at least one expedition per year. Um, so in 2012 or so there was a we call it the pilot expedition to Bolivia in the Amazon region, uh, where uh, one of our team members Phil uh, went, and then he set the basis uh, for uh, what had been. The expedition of this year, of 2014, that just ended a couple of weeks ago, to Brazil and, uh, and Bolivia, in the, Bolivia, in the Amazon region. We called it uh, Bravo. Um, so we had two expeditions in 2012. One in 2013 that was Uganda, mm -hmm. and then one this year that was uh, that was in Brazil and Bolivia. But that's not all, because uh, meanwhile, uh, many of us got inspired, and so they decided to carry on call them pers personal initiatives. So, for instance, I did travel to Nepal, did some outreach activities there, and also I was uh, involved and invited to participate in a project in Haiti last January, in which also I went to some orphanages to speak about astronomy and oh. to 
for guys start parties, yes. And um, but there have been also other activities in Portugal, in the United States, uh, uh, for uh, for special communities. Uh, so yeah, so the project kind of grew and uh, took also. <laughs> some, I mean, some side of the project uh, start to showing up and size that we we could not imagine at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And now there is a yet another expedition that is planned for this year, that is in October. A few of us will go to Colombia to visit the areas and surrounding of Bogota. And this will be in collaboration with the planetarium in Bogota. And we will visit five schools there. So uh, Sylvan Westby is asking, how do you initiate an event? Are you contacted by the people there, or do you reach out to those particular, to the schools or the authorities in that area? Um, and, and what kind of support do you get when you're there? Uh, yeah, this changes from uh, time to time. Uh -huh. And from uh, school to school. For instance, the expedition in Uganda, we, we did not think about going there at the beginning, but we were invited uh, by, by people there and by the... Cafe Scientific, that is an international organization, and OED, that is an organization for astronomy mm -hmm. development. And uh, yeah, so we decided to accept the invitation and to start collaborating with them. And they have decided the schools we were going to visit. Okay. Of course, we put some constraints saying what we could do and uh, what we need, more or less. But yeah, that, that was their decision. While, for instance, in 2009, uh, we we visited 24 schools, if I'm not wrong, wow. and uh, some of these were uh, kind of suggested by our uh, sponsor, especially ESO. Mm -hmm. uh, others were chosen by ourselves with the help of local collaborators. Mm -hmm. Because so we worked in this way: we looked for uh, people, uh, local people, who can collaborate with us and who can give us support, especially in terms of logistics. And um, so they suggest us schools, and we work uh, out together with them the list of schools we want to visit. And something similar happened also in uh, in Brazil and Bolivia this year. Uh, we had local collaborators, and uh, we decided together with them the schools. Same will happen in uh, in Colombia. Okay. We have, in Colombia, for instance, we have been invited to go there. We didn't think about going to Colombia. It was quite difficult for us to find uh, funding to go there. Okay. But then in the end, local planetarium uh, Bogota will invite us uh, and um, will support us at least partially. And uh, so we can go there and uh, we will visit five schools that have been decided by them. Excellent. So you have collaborators with the schools, local planetariums. Uh, ESO you mentioned, so that's the European Southern Observatory, and OAD you mentioned, so those of you who've been watching for a while, we talked to Kevin Governor of uh, the Office of Astronomy for Development, um, oh my gosh, maybe a month ago, maybe a little more than a month ago, uh, and he just is inspires us all yeah. to do all the things all over the world, uh, he's really great at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and OAD, yeah, OAD supported us in uh, Truth Cafe Scientific in... Uh, uh, in Uganda. Mm -hmm. uh, now we hope we can support us also in next years. We, they, they, they are opening for a proposals, and every year we submit the proposal. So far, we didn't we didn't get any funding directly, but we hope sooner or later we will. Awesome. Yes, keep trying. Yeah, that's that's a <laughs> yeah. super oversubscribed um, yeah. proposal program. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, do you want to talk about some of the activities that you do with students um, sure. when you're there? Sure. Uh, well, our format has been more or less the same since the beginning, but at the same time, it's been also evolving. Mm -hmm. So the first activity we do is a kind of a icebreaker. We call it uh, Charlie Nagural, or anyway, uh, uh, starting talk. And uh, we invite people to to our talk, and it's a, a journey that starts from the school we we visit and goes towards uh, the limit of the universe. So we go through the Earth, planets, and then out of the solar system, and so on. And this is just to introduce the concept of distances. Okay. So which distances we are speaking about, and uh, 
while we are sitting in the universe, uh, and also to introduce some of the celestial objects they can see in the sky. And after this, uh, we do some sessions with the teachers, so teacher workshops in which we invite them to, to uh, especially uh, try to do uh, inquiry-based uh, activities with kids. So not only activities in which kids are taught concepts, but right. activities in which they can actually learn and discover things. And um, and while doing this, we also introduce some of the hand-on activities we are going to do with kids, and to which we invite teachers to participate. Some of the activities are. Uh, well, they are. They go from uh, basic observation of with the telescope, both during daytime. So, for instance, uh, sun observations through the method of, with the method of uh, projection of the of the sun, mm -hmm. and also star parties uh, sometimes when it's possible. Uh, then one very popular activity, for instance, is called uh, the Earth as a peppercorn. So yes. we imagine that, that the Earth. Yeah, we imagine that the Earth is the size of a grain of uh, pepper, and then we build solar system in this scale. Actually, mm -hmm. you need a quite big courtyard to do that. Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Most of the time, you cannot go beyond Jupiter. Maybe sometimes. Yeah, we we did that at an elementary school when I was in Virginia, and we took up the entire track that was like the length of the school. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. a peppercorn, but it was about that size. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then, uh, for instance, we asked them um, to build a sundial mm -hmm. just using a pencil and a piece of paper. Um, one activity that we recently developed was on, to say something about the rotation of the sun, just mm -hmm. seeing pictures of the sun and see how sunspots move on the surface. So they, we give some basic concepts on sunspots and uh, yeah, the, in the, in, uh, in the Sorry, picture I'm, a is the, I'm a little bit behind. Here's the sundials. <laughs> the sundials, yes. This is the sundials. This is in Chile. Uh, in Chile. This is in uh, Bolivia, actually. This oh, it's is in Bolivia. This is in uh, Israel del Sol, yes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was saying about the, the shape of the Earth. Uh, no, sorry, the rotation of the sun. So some people can, uh, many of them, uh, they cannot really understand at the first glance uh, the distinction between the rotation of the Earth, then the revolution of the Earth around the Sun, and then the rotation of the Sun. So, if we manage to sometimes to just uh, explain this concept, this is already a big achievement. Yeah. And when they, when we understand that they are aware of this of this concept, we can ask them to measure something about the rotation of the Sun. The same about the shape of the Earth orbit around the Sun. Many of them think that it's just a circular orbit, but in fact it is not. And so we try to make some experiments with them to understand uh, whether or not it's circular. Now, since it's Galileo Mobile, I understand that sometimes there are uh, Galileo scopes involved. Uh, that's another thing we've talked about here on the program. It looks like uh, in this picture here, <clears throat> here we go. But you were able to actually uh, explore telescopes with the, with the, with the students. Uh, yeah, I think that here. Like a tiny little lens in her hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is uh, that is Patty, one of our team members, being mm -hmm. with kids. Uh, I think it's always in Bolivia. Yes. Yeah, one of our activity. So. Um, First of all, our name, our name Galileo Mobile, uh, came from the fact that the original project was to travel on a van mm, okay. by mobile, and this is what we have been doing during the first expedition. And uh, the International Year of Astronomy was declared because uh, 400 years before Galileo, Galilei observed for the first time the sky with a telescope. Right, right. And so we combined these two names and we got Galileo Mobile. Cool. And uh, yeah. Galiloscope, as maybe you already said, some previous uh, uh, some of your previous uh, hangouts. Was, it's a telescope that was developed for International Year of Astronomy, and yes, it's, it's a basic tool for us. Both because it's a telescope that we can easily give to schools, <laughs> and 
you can uh, yeah you can take a kaleidoscope. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a it's a easy tool to to be carried and to leave to schools to to play. Oh. And also it it's easy to be assembled and uh, disassembled. So people can see what's in a basic telescope. It's in, in a refractor. So it's nothing magic, but it's cable lenses through which uh, you can see the sky much better than uh, with naked eyes. Yeah. So, so I've uh, already uh, uh, taken one apart and put one together on air. So I'm not going to do it again. But yeah. No, no. Is, don't this, do there's that. no glue. It's all plastic. I mean, yeah. well, I think except for yeah, some. Yeah, and, and, and it's good that people. They, 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 I mean, they're not scared because. When they see it, when they take a kaleidoscope and they can uh, put it on together, put it yeah. on, they can see that they actually can touch things. They're not scared by telescopes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so it's very friendly. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, what, are the teacher, uh, what are the teacher workshops like? What kind of things do you uh, go over with teachers? Well, um, one of the things is to Explain the activities that we propose, uh, which are all uh, uh, contained in our uh, handbook of activities. So these mm -hmm. are activities that, so the big majority is not something that we invented, but it's something that we adjusted for uh, our purpose. And uh, so we invite them to explain them some activities. Uh, we well, say the beginning we try to understand what they want to know, what they know, and uh, especially if they are motivated to participate. Uh, it's, it's not obvious because in some schools there are very motivated teachers, in some other schools teachers are kind of forced sometimes to attend the teacher workshop, I, I, but we are not really aware of that. Sometimes we, we go there and then we realize that, uh, I don't know, that the boss of the school forced teachers to, to attend our uh, our workshop, so it can right, it can also right. happen. And yeah, like for instance, in a school, uh, at some point after half an hour, there was a question by a teacher. Uh, I said, okay, but you are speaking about uh, activities of astronomy, but how can I use these activities? I teach English. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, okay, every teacher is. In invited to, to participate, but uh, right, of right. course, if you teach literature, uh, it's not so obvious, the connection. Well, there is always a connection, but it's not so obvious. Right. And uh, yeah, this is one of the things that can happen with a project like, like ours. Uh, but in most of the cases, there are uh, science teachers. They are motivated to use astronomy also, not, not only as like something that is funny, but also for uh, their curriculum. And um, and therefore, uh, they can sometimes use our activities for uh, teaching something about, say, geometry, for instance, for math, uh, teachers of math, or uh, also there are activities that are uh, interesting for uh, teachers of uh, physics and of science in general. Mm -hmm. um, and we tend to communicate them this inquiry-based method of teaching, so just not being uh, uh, saying, uh, okay, you have to learn this and this and this, but try yeah. to raise questions for kids. Right. Have them raise questions, have them do the activities. I'm teaching a class right now that's inquiry-based, and I, it's thrown the students off a little bit, I realize, because it's like, let's do an activity! Yeah. Experiment with velocity and acceleration <laughs> and tell me how it works. And then afterwards, they're like, why don't we start with that? And I'm like, mm, I don't want to give it all away at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a different method than most of us are used to learning in school. Yeah, totally, totally different, yes. Yeah. School uh, it's most of the time quite classic in the sense that they, there's a teacher telling you what you need to know. Right. But this is, this is not the best way to, to learn. I right, think. right. Yeah. Like, we, we have the science to show you. It's not the best yeah. way to learn. We promise you. <laughs> this will work out in the end. <laughs> so then um, these teachers, I take it, are then hooked into... the their, it's, it's part of the Galileo teacher training program, so now they're hooked into... Um, and, and an international network of teachers as well. Yeah, we tend to connect them with this international work of the uh, teacher uh, network, mm -hmm. so they can feel also more motivated. And uh, we give them some certificates uh, after attending uh, successful, uh, successfully the, the workshop. So they feel again motivation is uh, is a main factor. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, do you have a maybe a favorite experience either with students or teachers um, showing them some kind of activity? A favorite in sense uh, a day that was special or a favorite activity? Um, like a day that was special, like. A, well, it's it's quite difficult to say. Uh, I, when I when I travel and go to these expeditions, I have to say that every day is, is special. I, I cannot really make any uh, any choice. Uh, it, it's quite quite difficult. Maybe the the most special day was at the very beginning, at the very first days so of the first expedition, uh, in this in this place in Bolivia. That place I felt quite magic atmosphere and. Uh, Kids were really interest, interested interested in, uh, in learning mm -hmm. and in hearing from us. But again, maybe it was just because it was the beginning. Otherwise, it's really it, every day it's unique and different from the previous. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and maybe a favorite activity. Do you have a favorite activity that you do? Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I, I do this uh, observation with the telescope. Oh, but okay. my, uh, yeah. But maybe yeah, my favorite activity is this, uh, the Earth as pepper corn because um, you have you also have to to work you uh, so you move it's a kind of a little travel say a little journey through the solar system mm -hmm. so uh, if I have to pick up an activity yes yeah, that one cool yeah yeah scale models the solar system uh, it even blows me away every time um, <laughs> <laughs> when you set up a scale model solar system. It's like, yes, it's on the Earth, and it's so far away from the sun. Yeah, space, yeah, yeah. guys. As uh, several of our commenters, so Michael Jobin's been uh, mentioning, outer space is really big, uh, and, and none of us can do a good enough Douglas Adams impression, but we totally don't know where you're going. Um, but um, also talking about, uh, I guess, back when we were talking about the age of the universe and how that can conflict sometimes. 13.8, uh, 13.7 billion years old is the universe, um, and it's true that there is uh, a larger extent. So it's a little, it's a little off what we're talking about here, but the larger extent of the universe, um, which is a good astronomy cast uh, topic, I should, I should mention, so that they're back yeah. on. Totally. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, this is one of the best, one of the strongest conflict we we find. But for instance, we got uh, in, in Uganda there was a one professor who said, okay, maybe just for God, say, thirteen point eight billion years is like a, a week. So yeah, because God right. calculates time differently. So I mean, <laughs> you can get out of these uh, problems and using some tricks sometimes. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, so, are there? So, uh, you mentioned that there is a documentary. Um, so, you guys already have that posted on the site. So, I've I've put a link to Galileo-Mobile.org in the um, showcase. So, if you <laughs> if you're looking at the Q and A app, uh, you can click the little Rubik's cube thingy up here, the little nine squares. Um, that'll take you to the showcase, which will take you to the Galileo Mobile website. Uh, and they have their you have your documentary up available for free on Vimeo. So that's fantastic. Yeah. And you said you have a second documentary on the way? Yeah, it's it's done. We just have to decide the day of the release. It will be in this fall. Okay. And then there will be also a third documentary that is just just been filmed in Brazil and Bolivia. Okay. But okay, I still have to work on that. But I think for next year it will be we will have yet another documentary. Awesome, awesome. Um, what are ways that people can follow what you guys are doing and maybe even help out? Well, following, uh, surely there is our blog, uh, our Facebook, and our Twitter, so social networks, as usual. Uh, help out, uh, well, the best way is to contact us. We are a, so we are quite a big team, and uh, our internal structure is a bit complicated because we are spread all around the world. Yeah. But it's likely that we will need uh, help for uh, next year activities because we have a big project coming up that is that consists in building up a network for schools in South America mm -hmm. and so it's likely that we will need uh, hands for uh, help in this big project so the best way is to contact us through Facebook or uh, our email and uh, just introduce yourself and say excellent. what what you can contribute to the project excellent excellent very cool um, and I wanted to ask you, so so you, you mentioned you just started a new postdoc in astrophysics. Do you mind telling telling us a little bit about what you, you do your work in? So, so far I've been working on a, a 
astrophysical uh, magnetodynamics, so numerical simulations uh, of magnetic fields in the universe, especially in the interstellar medium. Now I switch to something that is more related to uh, with planets, so I will do study of um, related to exoplanets uh, and also to the physics of ice. And so this is a, it's a kind of a double subject. One subject is to look for uh, aurora emission signatures from exoplanets. Okay. And the other subject is to study the physics of ice to try to see if there are there is way uh, to model climate through the, the study of the ice. And okay. so do climate models uh, applicable hopefully to exoplanets. It's a oh, cool. three year it, it's a three year project and. Uh, Started one week ago, so <laughs> I, uh, so far I've been uh, doing like just bureaucracy. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Just getting settled. Yeah, yeah totally makes sense. Settled. Awesome, cool. Well, thank you so much for for joining us. Um, I want to do a few quick announcements uh, for you guys watching. So uh, we are back from DragonCon, which means our full uh, host of of hangout shows are back. Uh, which means that Friday at noon, ugh, no, maybe noon Pacific, um, which is 2 p.m. here, so that's 7 p.m. GMT, um, is the Weekly Space Hangout. I think I got those times right. Uh, but check the CosmoQuest Google Plus page. They'll be putting the event there. Uh, the Weekly Space Hangout crew is back. Fraser Kane and a bunch of us who cover the astronomy beef will be talking about this week's space uh, stories. And so you can join us for that. Um, uh, virtual star parties on a monthly format. That's usually the first Sunday of the month. We're past that one for this month. Uh, and Astronomy Cast is back. So Pamela Gay and Fraser Kane got started with Astronomy Cast last Monday while Pamela was in Portugal. She's still in Portugal for the uh, European uh, Planetary Sciences Conference. So <laughs> we have Astronomy Cast back. We have Weekly Space Hangout back uh, and Learning Space. Uh, next week we'll be talking about cool cosmos and irrelevant astronomy from the Spitzer Space Telescope program and how they do those really fun videos that star some of our favorite geeky stars, such as Felicia Day and Will Wheaton. Uh, so we will not be talking to Felicia Day and Will Wheaton, unfortunately, but we're going to be talking to Carolyn Brinkworth and Tim Pyle, who are awesome uh, and, and instrumental in getting these videos made. So that will be our show next week. Um, I think that's all I have for announcements. Go to galileo-mobile.org, Galileo Mobile on Twitter. I just searched Galileo Mobile on Facebook and, and liked it, so go check them out. Um, and if you can support them in any way, uh, that would be awesome. So, Fabio, do you have any uh, last words of, of inspiration about Galileo Mobile? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for inviting me and uh, the World Galileo Mobile to speak about our project. Yeah. Uh, last word of inspiration, I think it's our motto, to be under the same sky, to feel connected to each other, and to live in a, try to live in a better world. Awesome. 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 I totally want to go on a van trip around the world now and do this job. <laughs> Come and join us. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, uh, Fabio, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. This has been Learning Space. Thanks. Bye. Bye.